with, with uh, QRL. So with that, further ado, Hilary. I'm Hillary. Um, if you want to chat with me at any point, my Twitter handle is hmason, and I'm h at bit.ly. Uh, so how many people here write code? Awesome. OK. How many people here write checks? <laughs> All right. That's pretty much everyone, I think. OK. So, so this talk is going to be uh, more data, less business. Uh, so I apologize to those in the latter category, but hopefully you'll still enjoy it. Um, and I'm really just going to talk a little bit about our philosophy at Bitly with working with data and a little bit more broadly about what a data scientist is, is it a thing, and why Hadoop sucks. <laughs> um, so I'm a scientist, and I'm at a, a small startup. We're, uh, we're about 38 people now. Uh, the company is Bitly. Uh, we grew up here in New York. It's a very New York startup. Um, came out of Betaworks. Uh, and we have a science team. And I've discovered, as I've been building out this team, that it's a really unusual thing to have at a small company and an unusual thing to have in the way that we do it, where we're not researchers sequestered off in a corner uh, you know, begging for data and writing research papers. You know, we're actually building production data systems alongside our product and regular engineering people. Uh, and so it's put us in a bit of an interesting position. But before I get into the philosophy, um, our goal at Bitly is to understand what is happening in the world in real time. And I can tell you why we, we have this goal and why we have the capacity to actually attempt to do this. So for those who don't know Bitly, we take big fat things and make them tiny. That is URLs that look like this and make them look like that. Um, and we do this quite a lot of times every day. Uh, it's not the size that matters, not anymore. That, that may have been true three years ago, and that was what made Bitly useful in the beginning. Uh, but we track analytics around all of the different links that are shared. And so our links, uh, all are 301 redirects. That is an HTTP standard. Um, so if you do a curl or wget on a, a Bitly link, you'll get a 301 that tells you where the eventual long URL is. All links are permanent, and it does not break the internet. Uh, and these links show up in all kinds of crazy places. So this is where you would expect them. Uh, they also show up places like this. That is the Dalai Lama's custom bit.ly domain. Uh, and they show up in really insane places, like YouTube, which is not so weird. But there are actually bit.ly links being shared inside of Minecraft, uh, which is kind of fun and sends us some very interesting data. So we get all of this data from different social networks around what people are sharing. And we can see how things propagate from one network to another, uh, and from one person to another, and one from group of people to another group of people. And so that's why we have this perspective on what the world is paying attention to at any given time. And it is global. Um, the traffic is about 50% US, 50% outside the US. Uh, this is just a sphere with latitude and longitude points plotted on it. There's no map here. And that's from one hour of traffic. Um, so all of this sort of came to us as a surprise. And this, by the way, was one of the most clicked baby photos in all of 2011. Um, <laughs> I'm not kidding about that. Uh, so Bitly was never really intended to be a company from the beginning, and then it was never really intended to be a URL shortening product. And then uh, you know, things sort of evolved organically and in a surprising way. And it's not that typical story of someone who has a brilliant idea and builds that brilliant thing and then makes lots of money in the end. Uh, it's more you know, somebody built some really clever things that you know, led to more clever things, and now we've got a ton of data, and we have to figure out what's going on. Uh, and hopefully it'll lead to that same happy ending, but who knows. Um, and so this is at large scale at this point. Uh, tens of millions of unique URLs per day, hundreds of millions of clicks on those URLs uh, from every imaginable social network. So any forum online in which people share links with each other sees bit.ly links. Um, and this is in total tens of billions of URLs. And we do see both the event where someone shares the link, when people click the link, and then the content itself. 
So this is big data. Um, that is, if you're not an astrophysicist or a, a biologist, it's big data. Um, I actually prefer not to use this term because I spend most of my time taking that data and trying to make it small data so I can actually do interesting work with it. Um, and so, as Matt said, I think we'll see a, a change in the vocabulary and a commoditization of the tools to make that happen. Um, and I'm also not a huge fan of the term data scientist, though I'm willing to go along with it. Um, I tend to think that data science exists in the middle of all of these things. So uh, math, statistics, computer science, and the ability to write algorithms, engineering, and then hacking, which I don't mean to be the evil sort of I'm stealing your bank account and password info style of hacking, but the I've got a problem and I can make something work with the resources I have available to me kind of hacking, uh, which may mean cheating in a way that makes traditional academics a little bit uncomfortable. But at the nexus of each of these, we find nerds, and <laughs> there in the middle, we find awesome nerds. <laughs> and as Matt said, even more in demand now than ever before. Though people don't know it. Actually, my cab driver on the way up here from my office is from Iraq and has a master's degree in applied math and physics from Columbia and couldn't find a job. So I got his resume. If anyone needs a, a mathematician, he seemed really smart. Um, so at Bitly, we ask, you know, we have all this data floating around. We have a bunch of awesome nerds. Uh, what can we learn from a lot of people talking to each other? And what we essentially have done is captured gossip in one place for the first time uh, on an infrastructure where we can ask questions of it. So it really is this very basic human behavior of finding something you think is interesting and emailing it to someone else or putting it on Facebook. Um, and so we can learn a lot of things from that. The first one is that everyone experiences social networks very differently. And so this is totally real. Um, this is a girl who thinks any white person on Twitter is a spam bot, which is probably true for her, though judging from most people in the room, not true for any of us. Um, and here's another one where we found it on Facebook, where this guy held a funeral for his fish, um, where his Lego people attended. You know, this is not something that I would ever see in my Facebook feed, I think. But, uh, but, you know, for him, this is his experience. Yeah, the comments are fantastic. And we actually saw this in our data twice. Once on Facebook, the photo, and then once on Lamebook, uh, once it started getting really popular. So it's may Cod rest his soul. Um, so your experience of that site is not my experience of that site. And uh, social networks give us this very personalized look at how a forum exists that you can't forget um, is not the same for everyone. So we've also learned that devices matter a lot in how you consume information. And so this is a graph we did starting with the you know, midnight Monday morning here going to Saturday and Sunday uh, by hour of the week of device usage in four categories. Uh, so you have desktop, which here means any computer browser. Uh, we have smartphones. We have gaming devices, which are things like Nintendo, 3DS, and Playstations. Um, and then the last one, oh, that is the last one. There's tablets, which is iPhones and Kindle Fires and whatnot. And there are a few interesting things to see here. Uh, we actually took a bet in my office on when the greatest amount of iPad usage would be during the day. I lost, so I bought the beer, but it turns out the answer is that uh, iPads are used more in the evening, browsers are used more during the day. You can see the smartphone, you can actually see when people have lunch. This is all normalized by time zone. And then we've got some weird things like this green peak here, which is, my theory is college students, because that's people looking at links <coughs> on their gaming devices. That's Thursday night. And we can also look at device similarity. So this is a matrix of how much two devices resemble each other based on their usage and time, not based on any other factor. And so white means they're the same, and dark means they're extremely different. So for instance, Linux and the Kindle are uh, very much not alike. But uh, Linux is very much like Windows, not like the Mac at all, which is strange. iPhone and Android are alike. Uh, the Kindle is really unique, so people use it in a very different way than anything else. Also, the networks you use matter. So this is something we did where we looked at the half-life of a link, given the, the network that you shared it on. 
Uh, and we, we found two factors that influence that. So the half-life is when the link will receive half the clicks it will ever receive. Uh, and we found that for Twitter, it's short. It's 2.8 hours. For Facebook, it's a little longer, about 3.1 hours. Uh, for other networks, uh, like YouTube, is seven hours. StumbleUpon is quite long as well. Uh, things that appear in virtual worlds, so we see a lot of data from Minecraft and Habbo Hotel and such, are also much longer. Um, so one of the factors was the design of the platform on which you're sharing that content. So this tells you something about uh, if you want to optimize how your content's being spread, uh, when and how you should share it. The other thing that affects this is the kind of content. So we looked at a bunch of links that fell into the category of breaking news, and those, of course, are much faster, um, as opposed to things that we found to be interesting all the time, where we mostly looked at pictures of kittens and otters. Because um, you know, those are great whenever you see them, um, and those were much longer. So the real world matters. Um, to be a little bit serious, this is uh, click data per hour in the countries involved in the Arab Spring last year. Um, so this goes from uh, October of last year all the way through to the beginning of the summer. And each little bump here is a day. So that's the normal diurnal pattern. Um, and so we can zoom in on a few. This is Egypt, where you can see where they actually cut the internet connection off. Um, and this is Tunisia, and this is kind of an amazing graph because they did not interfere with the infrastructure for connectivity in Tunisia. That's where the revolution happened. And so from just this little pattern of people clicking on bit.ly links, which are you know, a sample of links shared on social networks, you can see that the real world, something crazy was going on. Um, so I'm not a domain expert on foreign affairs, but we have shared this data with people who are, uh, and I'm really excited to see what they come up with. So to lighten the mood, I threw in a few other facts. 3% of all clicks in 2011 went to pages about the top 100 celebrities. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's true, and we spent a lot of hours of Hadoop figuring that out. Um, also, this is the cutest kitten. <laughs> we got a new cluster and we had to test it. Um, right. So the last thing I want to point out is that context matters. Uh, one of the things that intrigues me about the Bitly data set is that we see not just an article or a link, but we see everything people clicked on before they come to that link and where they go after that link. Um, just through this cloud of uh, the social consumption of links. So for the average user who clicks more than one link, we will see six links from them every day. Uh, so if you're active on social networks, we probably see quite a lot of content about you. Uh, and we can roll that up in aggregate. And so this is a piece we did with Scientific American where we are interested in how people read about science on the internet and what else they read. And we found a few really funny things like physics and fashion were really close together. And when I went back and looked at the data later, it turned out that there was a story about clothing made out of milk that was really popular that week, uh, which might explain it, but maybe physicists are all really fashionistas. Um, and we found a few other funny things. So for this audience, I think you'll enjoy that uh, statistics and math are not connected at all. But computer science is right in the middle of both of them. So you know we win right there. Um, and then a few other bizarre things, like uh, Chemistry is all the way sort of out on its own as this religion, and travel too. Um, you know, we didn't put it in the graph, but adult content also was out on its own. And we find that uh, people who look at adult content only look at adult content. People who look at religion only look at religion, and people who look at chemistry really only look at chemistry. <laughs> And here's another graph, which you can't read at all on, uh, on this screen, but I can share it later. Uh, this is a new map of the media landscape. So we built uh, a graph of the top 20 news sources in the US, and people who read the New York Times read real clear politics. The overlap is really complete. A small percentage of people who read the New York Times read Al Jazeera. A small percentage of people who read Fox News read Al Jazeera. Nobody who reads the New York Times reads Fox News. Um, and so we, we can see it in this, this sort of uh, 
This is not a pretty graph. Um, it was more of a functional graph. Um, and this is interesting because it, it lets us sort of redraw the context of how we see information. And if you're pushing a story out to one vehicle versus another, you can make your decisions based on the kind of audience you want to reach. All right, so we're very interested in this question, and I'm going to try a live demo, which may fail miserably. Um, can I have a web browser, please? Thank you. Does this actually work? Yes. Somebody juggle. Um, don't make fun of my length. Okay. That's always nice when that works. Is this legible for anyone? Okay. Um. Oh, there we go. All right, I've never tried this in Firefox before or on a keyboard this colorful before. Um, but what we're doing here, uh, I've been told not to go on too long, but so I'll keep it pretty brief, is that uh, we're taking, for every click on a page, we extract the most significant keywords and phrases from that page, and then we build a time series of clicks to that phrase over all of the pages containing that phrase. We register that at a rate of clicks per second. And then we look for things that are getting a disproportionate amount of clicks per second. In this case, two standard deviations above the mean expected clicks per second. And so what we see right now is, of course, the Kardashian collection, uh, Whitney Houston. I don't know who Billy Strange is, so uh, let's see. Um, he passed away. Let's find something a little more exciting. Danica Patrick. Um, Kate Middleton goes for a walk. All right. <laughs> so what we can see here is that the, uh, the previous uh, rate of clicks per second on Kate Middleton was very low, and then all of a sudden, a couple of stories where she takes her dog for a walk, um, bursting up here. And, oh, high heels. That sounds... Well, this is what people are clicking on. And you go through this sort of emotional process with the data where you first get uh, really excited because it's interesting, and then you get really depressed because it's Kardashian collection. And <laughs> you know, then you eventually get excited again. Um, and so here's one that's fairly complicated where you can see that uh, this is what we're detecting here. And I, well, I'm not going to read you the story, but. Um, but that's the idea. And we can also do this through by topic, so just looking at finance, say, or, or a location. Um, and the very last thing I'll show you is a search engine where you can do a query. But what it, it actually is is a ranking engine, not a search query at all. So this is pizza. Here, let's see if it can get really big. Um, and so this is, you know, out of all the documents being shared right now through Bitly, about 6,000 of them contain the exact phrase pizza, and here they are rank ordered by what's currently being clicked on the most. Um, that's not so interesting, but I am a New Yorker, and I want to know what's being clicked statistically disproportionately in New York around pizza. <laughs> and it's always fun to contrast this with uh, you know, something like that, which is California at large. Uh, they've got weird ideas of what pizza is out there. Um, but the fun thing about our search is that it, it's not so much about queries at all as it is about selecting some subset of the data and then looking at it in real time. And so the values that go into the, the ranking calculation are updated up to every second. And so here's just everything being read disproportionately in California. Um, and it's always fun to do this for... <clears throat> hey, Larry, we should yes. probably actually wrap up. Um, okay, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, no, 
Because I just wanted this, uh, you know, people to get a chance to ask you questions. It was okay. amazing, though. All right. No, really. Um, Wonderful. Thank you. If you go back to the slides, I have one more, and I think it says thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is awesome. This is so much fun. This is on. Yes. Uh, you haven't yet gotten to the point where Hadoop sucks. Oh, right. Um, so actually, uh, none of the live stuff you saw here at all uses Hadoop. Um, some of the graphs we made on the longitudinal data and all the fun stuff where we try and find cute kittens and babies uh, use Hadoop. But the, I mean, all it is is a structure for running queries in parallel against data that you store in a redundant file system. And so it is entirely impractical for doing uh, real-time products. That's why it sucks. Uh, so what do you use for real-time analytics and real-time data monitoring? Uh, whatever works best. A lot of our stuff is homegrown, unfortunately. Um, a lot of it's written in C. The rest is in Python. We use Redis quite a lot uh, as a data store. The search interface I showed you runs in Zoe, which is a LinkedIn open source project that runs on top of Solar. It's actually a very clever hack where it lets you have two simultaneous search indexes over the same data set where you write into one and read out of another. You can swap them very quickly. Uh, to do this sort of thing. But the other half of our search lives in a Redis cluster where we're updating memories off the stream, or memories, values off the stream, and, uh, and that's actually being called into search at query time. All about taking big data and reducing it to a size that you can actually go and solve some problems with it. Uh, can you shed some light on your approach? Sure. Because all the presentation was all about fancy graphs, which don't really help us solve the problem. They don't really what? Help you solve, you know, articulate a problem and go after and solve it. So what do you usually do for that? So I think there are two parts to your question. The mm -hmm. first one is around uh, big data and the term, and the second one is how do we actually solve problems? Okay. So the first one is an interesting, it, it becomes a matter of semantics, right? So for some people, big data is data that won't fit in Excel anymore. And for some people, it's data that won't fit on one server anymore. Um, and so where you draw that line is very difficult. And so, you know, I know people who work in fields where they have so much data, they're at the point where they have to spend a lot of money to build custom data stores and custom hardware to even look at the data. Uh, to keep it, much less even do anything interesting with it. And we're very lucky in that we're definitely not at that scale. Uh, and so we can do this kind of stuff with commodity hardware and a lot of commodity software and clever hacking. Um, in terms of your second question, which is how do we actually solve problems, um, assuming that's the philosophical question, um, I really do find that a lot of my job is asking good questions, and the answers are generally trivial or sometimes impossible, but at least you know once you've asked the good question. And so what I'm showing you here are uh, different aspects of way we, the ways we look at social data that I think are interesting, um, not necessarily a process for, for solving any of these problems. Great. Actually, unfortunately, we need to... Uh Move on to the next uh, presenter. Hillary is going to be around. Thank you. Hillary is going to be around hopefully um, after this, uh, you know, for the networking part of the event. Thank you very, very much.